Today on The Future of Everything, the future of neuromorphic computing. Now, we are all familiar with conventional computers to, to some degree. You plug them in, they use electricity. They calculate stuff, word processors, Excel, PowerPoint. They show movies, graphics. Uh, you can access the internet for social media. You can play games. Now, everybody with a desktop computer knows that they need to be plugged in and they can get hot. Some estimates are that a single personal computer is about as hot as a 100 watt light bulb. Everyone with a mobile computer or phone or tablet knows that the battery is key and it can get hot while it's operating. Now, what does this have to do with anything? Well, recently, artificial intelligence AI systems are emerging that can do pretty amazing things. They are often based on a new technology called deep neural nets. They can recognize an image, they can translate and understand text, and sometimes their performance starts to be similar to humans. And that's why they're called intelligent. But these systems are incredibly expensive and they're expensive in a specific way. They're expensive for in electricity to build. There are huge farms of computers. Imagine millions of 100 watt light bulbs that are just constantly running, building these AI systems. A recent model for understanding uh, human language took an estimate of $5 million to build. Uh, all those computers crunching numbers to make the model. And yet the human brain understands language, interprets images all the time, and it does not generate anything near like the heat of a, of a small, much more than a small light bulb. If we're gonna continue to create expensive and powerful computer capabilities, we need to figure out how computers can run more like the human brain perhaps, and less like these multi-million dollar arrays of hot computers. This is kind of the focus of this field of neuromorphic computing, building computers that, more, that are more closely modeled on the way the human brain works. It's always been fascinating, but there's now an urgency to it as researchers and companies around the globe demand more and more power for this AI technology. Okay, so Professor Kwabana Boahen is a professor of bioengineering, electrical engineering and, com and computer science at Stanford. He has worked on neuromorphic computing models that promise to be much less power hungry than current computers, but will provide potentially even better and faster computational capabilities. Kwabana, welcome. And is, is there in fact a crisis in the power and electrical requirements for the computing industry? And how could neuromorphic computing help that problem? Yeah, the, the sure is a, a, a crisis. Um... We've seen this coming for you know a decade or two. I mean, the performance of your personal computers, you know, plateaued way back in 2007. <laughs> 2000. So, so these upgrades and, I've been getting aren't that useful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, we used to be every three years we get new servers and so forth. We don't do that anymore, right? Because and even your phone now, <laughs> it's only yeah. So anyway, so we've seen that coming for decades now because it's been following the number of transistors on the chip has been following a very predictable trend called Moore's law. Mm -hmm. And now transistors are getting so small, it's getting harder and harder to stuff them in the now, same amount and, of who, who, Other than not having a better phone, what kind of crisis does this uh, precipitate? Yeah, so it's exactly what you refer to now, training these models, because now it used to be that compute was getting, for the same amount of energy, you could do more compute, because when you make transistors smaller and you pack more of them, they use less energy. So you get more compute for free. Now it just turns out that because that has plateaued, you just have to deploy more and more computers in these data centers or clouds, and they use more and more power. And the figure you quoted, you know, basically the uh, market rate for like running these models on the cloud, if it took 355 GPUs running for a whole year, to train this language model that you, you mentioned, GPT-3. And that the market rate for that is $4.6 million. And this has been doubling, the amount of compute used to train these models has been doubling every three and a half months. That's three and a half like, months? Yes, that's 10 or 11 times a year. And if, and if I'm not mistaken, that's much faster than the Moore's law that you quoted Yeah, Moore's before. law is uh, doubling every, every uh, two years, you know? <laughs> And this is like seven times faster than Moore's law. And, um, and so, and also, you know, so next year it's gonna cost them $46 million to train this thing, right? 
to be state of the art. Right? So, so you take your inspiration and always have from the human brain as a computer. Tell me what the key insights that your group and people in your field have had about the brain and how are we doing at translating some of that into um, uh, silicon technologies? Yeah, our thinking about that has evolved over time, you know, as neuroscientists have discovered more and more about how the brain works. And, you know, kind of every 10 years, we realized that our thinking was very naive, right? <laughs> so 10 years ago, I call, it, I call it raising your consciousness, right? So we are always kind of raising our consciousness in that respect and obsoleting everything we did or knew, right? Yeah. Yes. Which is fascinating, which is really exciting. And so um, I can break it down to you like this, right? I think we went from what I'll call a synaptocentric. So synapses are the connection between the neurons. And yeah, and these models, uh, Russ introduced these deep neural networks, just focus on that aspect of the brain, okay? So that's why I'm saying they are synaptocentric. Uh -huh. And the idea is that this connection has a certain strength. Yes. And so we build these neural networks and we connect them together and the parameters are the strengths of these connections. And when we are training them, we are tweaking these strengths. So it's totally synaptocentric. And so that was kind of like what we thought was important in the brain like 50 years ago. Even because when you do look at slides of the brain, which I've looked at, yeah. you're impressed with the number of cells, but even more is the number of connections between exactly. the cells. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are the most numerous elements, right? And so it makes sense, yeah. But, you know, so that's a synaptocentric view. And then it moved to the next level. I mean, deep neural networks are still at the synaptocentric. Mm -hmm. uh, still synaptocentric, but I would say the next level of understanding came with the somatocentric. So somatocentric. The soma, yeah, soma is the body of the neuron, right? That's okay. where the inputs get translated to outputs, right? Yes. And the output of neurons are these spikes. Okay, and so they send these little pulses of electricity. They're literally electrical spikes. Yeah, exactly, yeah, 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 exactly. And this, you know, in a deep neural network, they abstract that away. They just say, oh, the neuron is really excited or which means it's firing a lot or it's not. So they, they replace this discrete spikes with this continuous rate, Uh huh. right? And so that's, when we go to the somatocentric uh, model, we go back to spikes, right? Yeah. And so that's something that the neuromorphic computing has always been using these spikes. And it's fundamentally different from the representation that is using a computer. Okay. The, so that seems key because we know the computer is using way too much energy. Say, is it related to the energy usage? Yeah, I think like 10 years ago, we thought that was key. Okay. And we've sort of pushed that for the last 10 years, but now we are seeing its limitations. So I'll get into that. But, okay. but yeah, so that was kind of the previous thinking. And, um, but, you know, so what I say, the, uh, you were, you were asking about the energy that the spike, yes, is a, it, it's like the reason why computers are digital, they use these sort of binary representation, which means they have a high voltage or a low voltage and they send, those represent two symbols. Uh -huh. so that's what binary means. There's two symbols. And then along with that comes with a base two representation. So each place of the digit of the numeral representation, you double the weight, right? And so this is the representation that computers are using. And when you go to spikes, it's fundamentally different because there's only one symbol, huh. right? There's no zero, you know, zero is no spike. And right. so nothing is sent, right? And so you are in a unary representation and you only have one symbol, so it's unary. And there's no place. You're in base one. Every position. Is so how does it transmit information? Because you know people's basic understanding is the nice thing about binary is you're either zero or exactly. one. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, by, and by giving me a long string of zeros and ones, I can turn it into pictures and text and music. What do I do with spikes? Yeah. What you do with spikes is like it's like you know uh, you do roll call in your class, right? When the students show up in grade school, we don't do that in college, but you right. know, present, you, present, yeah, yeah, exactly. So you go along, everybody says present, present, present. And, you know, if somebody is not there, they can't say not present, right? So, you know, after you're done, you go and count the presence that you have. And that's how many people were in the room. That's how you present the information. It's a tally code. Okay. You know, you know it goes back pre algorithmy who was okay. this Arabian guy who came up with the concept of zero. That's really 
a very modern concept, like 3,000 years old. Before that, there was no concept of zero. It's a very abstract thing. So can yeah. these spike representations it, capture it, all the same information so that, that binary it, yeah, can do? Yeah, exactly. So that goes to the next level of understanding, which is just emerging, right? How do you most effectively use this unary representation? So we've known that it's unary for a long time, but we haven't fundamentally addressed that. And so we found that when we use spikes, we don't actually code information as efficiently as binary does. This is why you know deep neural networks are still using this binary representation, right? And and I can let me try and explain a little bit. So for example, in a you know suppose that I have a layer of like a thousand neurons, okay, or in base two a thousand twenty four, okay, that's two to the ten, right? And I just allow one any one of those neurons to fire. Yes. Right. Then there's one out of two to the ten choices. That means that that I can represent two to the 10 patterns, which means that any single spike carries 10 bits of information, right? This is real information, not binary right. high and low, right? right. And so right. this is how you present information. Activity is very sparse. And because you can choose one out of many possibilities, you have many codes that you can yes. use to represent information and therefore, you know, just a few spikes can carry as much information ah. as, you know, so I would need 10 binary signals to carry 10 bits, but I can just use one spike out of 1024 neurons. I see. So, so let, me, let me see if I got this. So for yeah. te in the binary uh, system, I have to turn on or off all thousand of those. And so I'm going to use power on exactly. basically on all thousand in a unary spike based computing you only have to pay for that one that you're turning on, perhaps. Exactly. And so that's something like one one thousandth of the power. I mean, I'm making exactly, that exactly, up. Exactly, exactly. So you're parking, if you park more bits into each signal, then you can use fewer signals. And, you know, work, equal to, work is equal to distance, force times distance, right? So, so the things that are going the longest distance in the brain are these communication, you know, sending the signal from this layer of neurons to the next. Yes, yes. You know, applying the weight and computing something is very, takes very little power. You just do that locally. It doesn't, signals don't travel a long distance to do that. And so if you can reduce how many of these signals you're sending over these long distances, then you can be much more energy efficient. So great. So that kind of makes sense. And, and I'm, I'm there. Uh, and I know that part of the work, and you've started to talk about distances, and I know that part of the, um, of the innovation that's occurred uh, in neuromorphic and other computing is this idea that we don't have to have these flat chips where everything is talking uh, in a flat two-dimensional world. There's now, we're building real three-dimensional computers. Tell me what that means for this whole exactly, enterprise. Exactly. So this is very interesting. So this is the key part. So now we are going to dendrocentric view of computing. Okay, this is the third word. <laughs> yes. So we had we had synapto, which was the connections. Yeah. We had somato, which was the neurons themselves that are yeah. doing the integration. And now we're, you're telling me about a third one. Yeah, dendrocentric. Dendro. So dendrocentric. We talked about the output end of the neuron, which is, you know, and then the input end of the neuron is the dendrite, you know. So when these spikes arrive at, you know, the, the, their destination, right? And then the synapse applies a weight, and then that it determines how strongly they excite or yes. inhibit that neuron that's receiving it. The part of the neuron that receives this inhibition or excitation is the dendrite. Okay, so and it's the input the, input part of the cell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The input end. Yeah, exactly. And so and so we used to think that dendrites were these very boring things. They just sum all these things together. That's kind of the synaptocentric view, right? And, um, but it turns out that over the last 10 years, we discovered that dendrites actually are doing amazing things, which, and what that implies is that these unary codes we thought, we thought about can be very complicated. They can decode very sophisticated messages. Huh. And so that allows us to pack even more bits in those unary spikes and, you know, save even more power. Okay. Right? And so, and, and, and so the, um, what you were asking in terms of, um, but let me just finish that dendrocentric yeah. part. So, so the thing, the new discovery, this is actually 10 years old, but now we're just starting to translate it into these neuromorphic, uh, you know, uh, systems we're building is that, you know, a dendrite is, uh, how do I put this? 
uh, you know, I told you about you got these 1,000, 20, 24 neurons and you got one spike happening. Yes. Okay? So now let's say we do two spikes instead of just one. Uh-huh. Right? So we've got, you know, we still have 10, 24 ways we can choose the first spike. Right. And then we have 10, 23 neurons left. So we have 10, 23 ways we can choose the second spike. Yes. And because of that, the second spike is also carrying close to 10 bits. Okay. Right? Because it's one out of 10 to the 23 possibilities. Yes. And so each spike we add is actually given us another 10 bits, right? Yep. And, you know, when you do this kind of thing, then you are encoding information with sequences, right? So this one goes first, then this one goes, then that one goes. Oh, that one goes, this one goes, that one goes. So those are all different codes. Yes. Right. And that gives you, keeps adding 10 bits per spike if you do it that way. So now you're coding information with sequences of spikes. And so the dendrite end, if you know you go one, two, three, like neuron one goes, neuron two goes, neuron three goes, that's a different code than if neuron three goes, then neuron two goes. Right. So one, two, three is very different from three, one, two. Yeah, exactly. And it turns out that dendrites can discriminate this, right? So the same synapses, the same weights, but if one comes in at the tip of the dendrite and then two comes in and then three comes in, the dendrite actually generates what's called a dendritic spike. It kind of, it's nonlinear. It just kind of like tends on. And so it so is sensitive. The, the, that sequence can be uh, de can be deciphered by the dendrite. And so it knows that there's a different signal being sent. Exactly, exactly. It passes because, it on. Yeah, it could be connected to all three. And if three came first and two came and then yeah. one, it won't respond, right? So I like to say if it goes ding, 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 it fires and it goes don, 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 it does, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, but, but, but I yeah. do understand how that yeah. sensitivity means that once again, this is a principle of what you've been telling me now, once again, you can pack a lot of information uh, with, and presumably with low energy into these communication protocols because yeah, of these if you can decode, if you're sensitive to the order, then you can get every additional spike from that same population carrying 10 bits, right? Right. So it really kind of gives you this very, uh, you know, it just expands your code space. So, so we've been spending so, a lot of time on, uh, uh, and you've been getting yeah. this great lesson on theory. <laughs> How close are we to implementing this stuff in hardware that's not the human brain? Yeah. Okay. So um, the you you I think we touched on the the 3D a little bit, which which was the fact that you know distances you know work is equal to force times distances. So of course you can shrink distances, you can actually save a lot of power that way. So it's this combination of making activity sparse, reducing yep. the number of signals you're sending around. And, and this is basic physics of the dissipation. Oh yeah, of, this is first dissipation principles. of energy as you go along a wire. Yeah, yeah, first principles. You know, this right. is how you figure out new exciting stuff. You know, <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah, 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 and so and so um, and it's great because you can talk to you know you can explain you know. We all know a little bit of physics, right? And this is intuitive, but you can just think of like LA, you know, the way we're building chips is sort of like LA. We've been building the sprawl, except that, you know, the, the, <laughs> you know, the, the, the city doesn't get bigger. We actually are shrinking the rooms and shrinking the roads and we just keep squeezing these people into tighter and tighter. And it's all in 2D. Yeah, it's all in 2D. And we've got to the point where it's like, you now we've got these capsule hotels you have in, you know, that's how small the houses you have in Tokyo, like we are packing. Yes. And the people in this case are electrons. We just like squish them so tight that we can't make things any more smaller. And so we have to go to like a Manhattan style, you know, uh, architecture where you do go in the third dimension, right? And this is the way to like keep distances small <laughs> if right. you can't is, shrink is, things is, anymore. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, this is the future yeah. of everything. I'm Russ Altman. Yeah. More with turning LA into New York and turning <laughs> flat computers into 3D computers next on Sirius XM. Welcome back to the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Professor Kwabana Boahen, and we're talking about neuromorphic computing and the promise for bringing computational speed up and computational costs down. So in the, at the end of the last section, you were telling us about this idea that we can get a lot more real estate on our computer chips by building up like, yeah. like and you use the New York versus LA comparison. So is that a pipe dream or is that happening? No, actually, so it's actually happening. So, you know, the memory industry, so by memory industry, you know, the people like Intel build processor chips and, you know, people like Samsung and, you know, SK Hynix build these memory chips that now it used to be that we had hard disk drives. We don't have them anymore, like right. you know, these magnetic storage devices. Now 
all your information is stored in actually a chip. It's just a specialized kind of chip. It's the same kind of technology, but it's really optimized for storing memory yeah, bits of information. And so that happened back in 2007. The memory industry decided that forget about shrinking this stuff. It's too expensive because memory has to be cheap. You know, so yes. they started going 3D and they and so now they are up to 96 layers of planes of memory in a single chip. So the reason why now we've got like very you know, similar five, to the Empire State Building, by the way, exactly, has, exactly. Yeah, yeah, roughly yeah, that number yeah, of yeah, four. Exactly, yeah, and this is the New York analogy. They, they built it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so so so. Um, so, so, so that's what they've been doing, and they've shown that it's very cost-effective, and 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 the you know. So I think that that's really exciting, and I think computing is going to follow the lead of the memory industry, and okay. um, and you know. So if we tie it back to um, you know what you started with this language model GPT three, it's called. It's got. This is the one that cost five million dollars to, to, to train. Make. Yeah, yeah. If you just in the that, power, that doesn't include the people and everything else. Exactly. Yeah, but you know, if you look at that, you know, the size of that network is measured in the number of parameters. These are like the number of weights in the connection, and it's got 175 billion weights. Okay. Wow. Now the memory industry just introduced a one terabit chip. You actually, if you have an iPhone 11. Uh, 12 you already have these you know 90 you have the 64 layers of memory in the in thing uh -huh. you know, like you've got half a terabit chip in there right and so it's either like three of these one terabit chips can store all the parameters of this gpt3 so that actually, means that you could put this phone. model on a phone okay yes. so that's amazing and and so and so we think of it as big but memory is amazing the 96 floors right <laughs> so 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 right. so now so now the trend then is like what we want to do is something called compute in memory. So instead of separating, taking these 175 billion parameters from these memory chips to the processor, crunching on them and moving them back, you know, mm -hmm. distance where I could go four times distance. Right. right. So you're moving a lot of bits and therefore you're spending <laughs> you're doing, a lot of power. Yeah, spending a lot of energy. If you could just like inside the memory chip itself, you know, compute. Right, basically, you apply those parameters as weights, and you get the result. It's called computer memory. This is something that neuromorphic we've been doing, you know, all along, and and now this has become, you know, the most promising way to save power. And again, so you go this, the memory is leading the way. So they've already stored the thing. Now we just have to sort of add that. Computer. Okay, so the technologies you were telling us, all those things you were telling about us about the, the cell bodies, the, the uh, synapses, the dendritic models, they now move into this 96 layer chip yeah. and you're doing the, com the compute in the same place where the memory is being stored yeah. and you're saving. Now, what kind of power savings are we talking about here? So yeah, I've worked it out. So something, um, this is, you know, kind of like, COVID and lockdown has been great for just sitting and thinking. Right? <laughs> well, there's a, I, I salute you for your positivity. <laughs> you know, after a while, you start feeling a little isolated, but, you know, you can just, you know, I'm one of those people that I can, my brain can entertain me, you know, for hours. Good. <laughs> so, 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 so I've spent a lot of time thinking and I'm telling you sort of my latest thinking on this. Yeah. And, and these ideas, uh, I'm really excited about these ideas. And, um, but you know, what my inspiration for, for this thinking was really, I was looking at the physicists and they talk about quantum supremacy. Uh -huh. And I'm like, wow, these guys got game. You know, they got a really nice story <laughs> telling about this, right? And, and this is the idea that the people who get control of quantum computing first are going to have a huge advantage in many areas. And I think that's the same for AI, but no, quantum supremacy is an idea, you know, a guy, a professor at Caltech, John Presco coined this term. Uh -huh. And this is the idea actually, you know, he popularized that term, but the idea goes back to Feynman in 19, you know, 88 or 90 or so, basically laid out how you can build a computer, but instead of using bits, classical bits, you use quantum bits. And instead of using ands and ors and negation as your primitive computations, you use superposition and entanglement. These are quantum primitives. Yes. And he showed that just by coding it that way with quantum bits and using these quantum primitives, it was supreme. 
you know, the, you know, us the- Ah, so it wasn't a competition between nations. No, no, it's like, you know, so you can take something that that is exponentially hard for a traditional computer. Let's say I, I had Q bits. We just talked about bits already, right? In in a computer, those Q bits can represent two to the Q different yes. pieces of information. Yes, yes. Right, and I need to the Q places to store them. In a quantum computer, just Q quantum bits, Q bits can store all those two to the Q patterns superimposed. Gotcha. So it's, now it's, we only have a couple of minutes. I want to yeah, make sure so, we get so, to, so, the yeah, suprem- yeah. to the to yeah. the uh, neuromorphic supremacy. Yeah. So it's just that you know, so supremacy has to the thing do with the thing that as the problem gets harder, the gap between you and the guy that you're supreme over just expands. Yes. Yes. And this is what's important because as you can see, the whole game of the brain and all this stuff is just building it bigger and bigger. And somebody who can get you know on a thing that he's opening that gap is just going to get more and more. Yeah, so it's really when I take all kind of gotcha. <laughs> thing, give you a supreme. So, 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 so these pieces, if you combine this dendrocentric dendro- view and these unary codes and 3D, yes, able to show that that's just supreme, neurally supreme compared to these deep neural networks running on these GPUs. Gotcha. And, and it leads to the power advantages. Yeah. So, so, so in terms of numbers, for example, if, you know, a network of a million neurons, the amount of energy is using right now could be enough for a network with 40 billion neurons. Whoa. So it's like, you know, that same amount of energy could do 40 times, 40,000 times bigger network. Or, you know, to translate it into dollars, you take those $5 million divide by like 40,000, right? And you are down to maybe a hundred thousand to train these networks if, if that if your energy bill. So that would be a total game changer in, in the ability of both industry and academics to build these models. They probably wouldn't just build the same models cheaper. They would probably just build much bigger models. Yes, but you also have to develop a whole new the whole stack. But yes. you know, but the point is that we are kind of at the coding and primitive stage. We've identified the right codes to use and the right primitives. To operate on them, just like the quantum guys, like Feynman did in 1990, but we don't have like Shor's, you know, factoring algorithm for prime numbers running on this. So now we develop the algorithm. Right. So now we have to, and that's what you yeah. say when you say the full stack. You mean even when we have the hardware, there's the software, there's the debugging uh, layers, there's the education and the workforce. Exactly. All of, but this is the vision for neuromorphic supremacy. That's your word for today. Thank you for (laughs) listening to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. If you missed any of this episode, listen anytime on demand with the SiriusXM app.